Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Wednesday, September 23rd, 2009. Welcome to a combined show for Conversations.net and FutureofEducation.com. Tonight it's Parenting 2.0. We're going to talk with the renowned expert Jane Nelson about parenting in the age of the Internet and social media. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time in Illuminate, we want to make sure to give you a little bit of an introduction. Uh, the show is sponsored by Learn Central. LearnCentral.org is a social network for educators. Facebook like in scope with Illuminate built in, so you are in an Illuminate environment. And when you join Learn Central, you get a free three person V room from Illuminate. And Jane, that's probably what you want to use based on the email you sent me today. Coming up on our interview series, lots of fun interviews. The schedule is really filled out. Tomorrow, Dana Boyd. Uh, should be an awesome interview with Dana from the Berkman Center. Many people are familiar with Dana's work uh, with youth and social networking. September 29th next week, John C. D. Brown on Tuesday night. Howard Rheingold and Joyce Valenza on Librarians on Wednesday night. October 1, Alan Weiss on the Business of Changing Lives. Uh, fascinating story of his uh, commercial involvement in, um, and um, pro bono work in education. October 6th, Dennis Lipke. October 8th, Learning Games. October 20th, SRI on social networking. The fascinating Tim Westergren from Pandora on November 3rd. Pandora's the music service. We're going to talk all about music and licensing and how that's changed. Henry Jenkins on November 10th. November 11th, Rethinking Education in the Age of Technology with Halverson and Collins. November 12th, the retired Stanford professor Larry Cuban will talk about his take on education and adoption in schools. Dan Willingham on December 1st, Dan wrote a book called Why Students Don't Like Sc Why Don't Students Like School? I'm going to talk to him then. Then December 2nd, Bob Compton on his 2 million minutes movie and the new one coming out. Curtis Bonk on his book, The World is Open, December 3rd, plus Clay Shirky, Doc Searles, Tim Magner, David Thornburg, James Paul Gee. Lots of fun people coming up uh, we don't have in the schedule yet. To use Illuminate, uh, it's very simple. Uh, you're looking at a participant window of people who are attending the session. Uh, below that participant window is a place where you can raise your hand. It's the hand with the green up arrow. With a group of this size tonight, you should be able to ask James some questions. If you think you want to ask a question through the microphone rather than the chat, this would be a good time to go up to Tools, Audio, and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your microphone is configured correctly. Uh, there are little emoticons down there as well, a smiley face, a clapping hand. Here's with me clapping for Jane coming on the show. A confused look as to why we don't have more people here on Tuesday, Wednesday night. And thumbs down, all these people are missing great material from Jane. Um, below the participant window is the chat area where you can leave a message. You can also, you'll notice, send messages privately to other uh, individuals in the show, but do be aware that anybody who's a moderator will see those messages. Um, when you do get ready to take the mic, I'll tell you what to do. And then right now I'm going to let you use the whiteboard. So we're going to switch to this map. And to the left of the map, you should see some different icons that give you options. I want you to look for the wand with the red star at the end. Go ahead and click on that, and then click on the map to let us know where you are. And at the same time, if you want to shout out in the chat where you're listening from, maybe the time and the temperature, it's a balmy 98 degrees or something outside of Sacramento, California, where we continue to have summer weather, and we're wishing it was fall already. So it looks like a U.S. only group tonight. Okay, well I need to let you know how much I've been looking forward to tonight's show. I've known Jane for many years. Um, she wrote a book called Positive Discipline that became the, the guide for our family. And, uh, and then we actually took Jane's training and, and got to know Jane personally. And this is uh, really a lot of fun for me to think about talking about parenting uh, where there's uh, this kind of social change. Uh, Jane, would you uh, like to introduce yourself briefly and tell us a little bit about um, what you do and how you got here? 
Well, Steve, first I wanted to talk a little bit more about what we did together because I was just thinking it's too bad I didn't tell you in advance to put up your article that you wrote on how after attending one of the lectures you took some of the ideas and used them with your managers in uh, your business. Do you have that article handy? Well, I could say that I couldn't find it, but I probably could find it. I'll, I'll pull it up and we can look at it later. Well, eventually that would be kind of fun, but it's, it's like, um, so many, many years ago, I now have seven children and 20 grandchildren, and I wanted to be a good parent and didn't know how, and so I would be too strict until I couldn't stand myself, and then I would be too lenient because until I couldn't stand my kids, so going back and forth until... Finally went into a class where they said we're going to teach you just one theory and how to apply it in practical ways that really work to help children learn self-discipline, responsibility, cooperation, all that good stuff. And so I was excited about that. And it's the, the theory is based on the work of Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers. And uh, so I started using it, and even though I had a lot of what ifs and yes buts. I see somebody else has 13 grandbabies and oh, which one of seven are you, Teresa? What's your birth order? I'm number six, and I and I'm I have five older brothers and one younger. Oh my goodness, you're the only girl. Yep. Well, we could have some fun analyzing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it's like I uh, just kept learning. Um, and sharing first in just little parenting study groups and then in for uh, cooperative preschools and kept learning and kept writing books. Eventually wrote 20 books, I think 18 of them on, on parenting, and just keep learning. So Jane, the question in the uh, chat is, who is the research based on? So it's Alfred Adler, right? Correct, and Rudolf Dreiker. Let, let's help let I spell me, this correctly. Yeah. Well, so I, oh, Alfred Adler, that's right. Rudolf, right, you got it. Except hey. that I think Rudolph doesn't have a P in it. Oh, is it an F? Oh, wait. Yeah. Just, no, it's just... What, what is it? All of a sudden, I've forgotten. I think it's R-U-D-O-L-F, yeah. While you're doing that, I'm going to pull up your website. Okay. And I'm gonna, we're going to do so by letting people see this article. Oh, this is your clear. article. <laughs> so this is the article. Although the picture isn't there, I, drew, I actually did a picture for this article that had the different tools you use as a parent. And I know. Uh, I love. I'm sorry those aren't there because the, the describe the tools. They were they were fun. Well, I remember that the top one was a hammer, and then there was a screwdriver and pliers and. I was trying to, to help my manager see that oftentimes the tools that they use to get people to do things uh, have consequences that um, they didn't intend. But of course it all came from your material. So the hammer was the instrument of brute force. The next were the pliers. People can scroll down. I'll put the link in there. I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's worth the the read, but it does it does bring us to your site. Which is kind but of fun. Except that the, we have a new design now. This we haven't changed all the pages yet, and this is one of them that we haven't changed. Yeah, there's the new design. Okay, so one thing that we thought, Jane, you had thought was that it might be kind of fun for people to play that video. So you should be starting to hear that video. So I just put it on pause. <laughs> well, why don't we let people listen to it? Oh, I thought you said they wouldn't be able to hear it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so my video stopped. If you came in late and you're still listening to Jane's video, I'm going to put the link in the chat again. You can listen to it later. But are we ready to close this window down? Give me a green check if you're ready. Where's the green check? <laughs> there we go. It's at the bottom of the participant window. So, Jane, I love that material. And I've just I've got a couple of links here. This is the Wikipedia article for Alfred Adler. Ah. And this is the Wikipedia article for Rudolf Dreikers. And you're right about the F. See there? Correct. Good. So um, 
Well, this is a great background, and, and the reason for these convers these live conversations is to, to look at how things are changing because of the internet. Uh, now, uh, we don't have seven children in our family. My wife and I have four, and we feel quite uh, amply challenged with four. And they are ages 21 down to 11. And we feel like there's the, the there's a very interesting range because uh, the 21 year old really didn't have nearly the access to cell phone use and web tools that the 11 year old does. So we get to watch sort of the variety of experiences. And if you're willing to bear with me, I'd like to show a video as kind of a prelude to our discussion. May I do that? Yes. <laughs> that is funny. So I think what I like about that is that it's obviously a play on the roles, but obviously we're all going through this change. And I can remember when it was the, the dads and the Blackberries, and and the family was saying, "Well, you know, Dad, why aren't you paying attention? You're always checking your email." And then all of a sudden, it became the kids and the texting, and now it feels like it's much more of a family affair as well. So I thought it might be kind of fun tonight to drill down on on what's changed and what hasn't, and what you know what are the parenting tools that you are discussing as people raise parenting issues now that relate to internet technologies. What, what's interesting to me is that all my children were raised before this happened, but uh, so now I've got my grandkids who are all have their cell phones. And it's very interesting to me, and it's my first reaction was just, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And But then I started hearing from parents who say that they have almost more communication with some of their kids with their texting, that they can tell them wherever they are, and they, and they seem to do that. Their kids seem to be much more willing to text than to talk. So, yeah, I, I definitely experienced that in our family. Uh, I like texting just as a communications medium in and of itself, but I also noticed that, that there's a little bit of an emotional distance to it that seems to make it comfortable. So um, my kids, I actually think I know more about where my kids are and what they're doing than my parents knew about me. But you know, one of the things that I do think is important, I was watching one of your recorded uh, archived discussions, who was it with the one that, that talked about the brain and what happens when kids are watching the screen? Right, iBrain. Oh, can you put that link on? Because I think that would be a very good one for people to watch. And I think it's the kind of thing that might be a good idea to watch with kids so that they really do understand even what's going on in the brain. And, and then I do think that uh, sitting down together at a family meeting or at a problem solving session and really discussing some rules together. I, I don't think it's a good idea for parents to create rules and then the, the kids just have to follow them. But if they have discussions where they work on rules that they can all agree to and about, because I do think it's very important. Do you, do you have the, the tool card on limit screen time? Sure. So let me go ahead and pull that up, which I'm going to do by sharing my desktop. And I'm while, going while you're bringing that up, I'll just talk. I just these are the new uh, deck of 52 tool cards that uh, to show people how many different tools there are that are non-punitive. But uh, and one of them these days that I think is important is limit screen time. But I hope that on the card it doesn't say that parents should do that. I hope it says that they should work with their kids to do it together. I don't have a card that says, oh, there it is, limit screen time. Hang on. Well, okay, so we should see this in a second. Are yes. you seeing it? Give me a green check if you can see limit screen time. Um, so according to this, like for young children, be careful about using the TV as a babysitter. And I remember, I shouldn't just say the TV, it should be, the, what I've noticed is that with my little grandchild now, sometimes they'll just give him his iPhone and he's sitting there with this iPhone really close watching the Thomas Train movie. And uh, so a little bit of that I think is just fine, but it could be way too much, I think, that could be 
not the best. So I think I've heard you describe two principles that I've heard from you before. One of which was family meetings and actually sitting down and talking together about the things that are going on. And then the second was sort of not talking at your children, but talking with them about how are we going to solve this. Are those, what I, am I being accurate Correct. there? Correct. But also, I, I want to just, you know, Matt has uh, brought up a point about not agreeing with number two. Where did it, it just went away? Where is it? But a blanket statement that does apply to all kids in situations. I'm so glad you uh, mentioned that, Matt, because one of the reasons that we have so many different tools is that there isn't any tool that works all the time for every child. And also, any statement, I always tell parents that you get as much information as you can. And then you use your heart and your wisdom to decide what really works for you. In fact, I'd like to know a little bit more about what your thoughts are about uh, that you think it's okay to have uh, computers in kids' rooms. So I'm going to give Matt the microphone. Matt, do you have a mic with you? Are you brave enough to come on and answer that? And if you are, you click on the mic button. Audio area below the participant window. Below the chat now. There you go. There you go. Uh, this would be good. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Matt. Matt, I thought we had you there for a second. You know, we can hear ourselves echoing back, so I think your mic is on. Uh, Matt, when, while we're getting to Matt, I would just like to say that one thing that I saw, I was in one family, busy in one family where they had five children, five boys, and they had just one computer in the family room, and so they had to negotiate for time. And the other thing is that the uh, kids could not be up in the middle of the night doing chat rooms, which a lot of kids are doing these days, and it becomes very addictive. And if their cell phones ring in the middle of the night or if they get a text, they get up and they answer them. They feel like they have to respond. You know, kids are playing games in the night. I just think that some of this can be, can be very dangerous. So Jane, one thing we did when cell phones became a device that our kids actually used was we did something that we called parking the phone. Uh -huh. So at a certain time of night, the phone had to be parked in the kitchen where it would charge and it couldn't be brought to the bedroom. I'm intrigued because now as computers really move toward laptops, uh, we've actually considered the same policy for uh, computers in the home with the kids, which is, okay, so reasonable school use, yes, you can ask for it and have it later, but you know, for the most part, we want you to park the computer and the phones at a certain time. Does that make sense? Well, to me it does, because I, I do think that it's just too easy for kids and adults to get very addicted to these and to so that it takes over their lives. So I think that uh, technology has great benefits, but it can also have some real liabilities. So one of the things that I've done when I've talked to uh, youth about technology is uh, when I've been asked to speak to youth, I always ask to have both the youth and the parents there. And then I do this little exercise where I have, I have all the chairs set up in rows when we start. We do, do a couple of things, and then I have everybody take their chairs and put them in a big circle. And I tell them that when we grew up, the chairs were in rows, and they're growing up in a circle. Because it was really expected when I grew up that there was a certain level of obedience and structure that was just assumed that you as a child conform to. And I noticed that my kids, uh, the younger ones, live in a world in which they're communicating with each other much more than they are with us. And there isn't that same societal expectation for obedience. Um, do you want to comment on that? Well, actually, I, I talk quite a bit about that in the first chapter of Positive Discipline because this is something that Drew, Dr Rudolf Dreikers talked about a lot, that society has changed. And that the, the, was a time when we had a very vertical type relationship in our society. In other words, uh, mom obeyed dad, or at least gave the impression that she was. Dad obeyed the boss. And there were a lot of minority groups who were willing to have this subservient role, whether they liked it or not. And so 
in th those days, kids had this model of authoritarianism all around them, and so they were more obedient, or so it seemed. They might have just stuck around more. But uh, today, society has changed where we really are interested in Dreikers and that are really supported the idea of equality and everybody having the rights to dignity and support, dignity and respect, including children. And so there, there is a lot more freedom, but we have to teach kids and give them the skills to handle this freedom. I just love it that somebody once said that on, since there's a, a Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, there should be a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast because the responsibility goes along with the liberty and the privileges. So this is why I just think it's so important to get kids involved in learning communication skills and problem solving skills and, and coming to agreements that everybody agrees to, not just what parents say, this is the way it's going to be, and kids, and then they think they've got an agreement that kids just rebel against. So I'm remembering how, I'm remembering why I love your material so much, Jane. So is, uh, is part of what we're hearing too that, that this, is, this is a better process as it's a transparent, collaborative process? I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say in the beginning? Well, I said, you want me to repeat how much I love your material? Yeah, that said, part. <laughs> <laughs> of course I said, I'm remembering how much I love your material. Uh, it also seems to me that part of what you're saying here is that, is that, that there are certain principles that have been uh, a core part of your books, which are related to helping teach responsibility, which relates to being transparent and collaborative in the building of solutions. I, I, exactly. And, and that is why we talk about uh, working with children instead of doing things with them, instead of to and for them. And it's why this, the family meetings in homes and class meetings in classrooms, we just think are so important for kids get to share their ideas and their thoughts and they're taken seriously and then they learn to brainstorm for solutions but in this process they listen to each other, they hear that there are different feelings and ideas and then they brainstorm for solutions that are really respectful and work for everyone. It isn't this dictator kind of a thing. So maybe in some of the same ways the educators you're listening will, will, will recognize that uh, the pedagogical thoughts of certain uh, authors are becoming more and more prominent in the time when you have this technology. Um, uh, educational thinking that revolves around um, the individual uh, initiative in education and um, their own interest, following their own interests. I'm, I'm not doing a job, good job of describing that, but I hope somebody in the chat will. It also seems like uh, uh, Dreikers, Adler, and Jane Nelson are eminently suited to this period of time in which the technology creates an environment of equality right off the bat. Yeah, yes. I, I think that uh, Adler and Dreikers were men way before their times because they were talking about equality, dignity, and respect long before it was uh, accepted by the society. But I'm seeing some chat. And uh, Matt, again, has said that using technology to build relationships, not hinder them. And, and see, I totally agree with that. And I'd like, I still wish we could get here more from Matt about what he means by this. But to me, this technology just gives more opportunities to, to just talk and discuss what is respectful to everybody and how they can use it. And this is why I was saying that the parents who really like it because they feel like they have more con contact with their children at certain times. And, I was talking with two of my grandchildren in the car about texting and why they like to text instead of uh, talk, that they've got their cell phones, they hardly ever talk on them, they just text on, text on them and it just they feel comfortable. But they were also recognizing the need that how it could just isolate people if they didn't sit down and talk with each other once in a while. So Jane, do you get that question in your seminars? Do people ask about uh, how to encourage that? Well, yes. Uh, we, we, see, we talk about it all the time, but one of the things that I help parents um, understand is how they sabotage this often. It's like one of the reasons that kids don't want to talk to parents is that parents don't talk, they lecture. 
you know, they talk, talk, talk. They tell kids uh, what happened, what caused it to happen, how they should feel about it, and what they should do about it. Instead of, um, do you have the card on curiosity questions? What, what we're always advocating is that education means to draw forth instead of to stuff in. And we're always trying to stuff in and then wonder why it goes in one ear and out the other. So when you ask curiosity questions, for example, asking kids, what, uh, what do you think happened? How do you feel about it? What did you learn from it? What ideas do you have to solve this problem? It's like drawing forth. Okay, yeah, asking instead of telling invites children to develop their own thinking. And they get to participate. You know, on these cards we had to be very brief, but there's just one little example of, of, that I do an activity with parents in my workshops where I'll have the telling parent and the asking parent. And the telling parent will say something like, um, go to bed. And the asking parent will say, what is next on your root bedtime routine chart? And the telling parent will say, go brush your teeth. And the asking parent will say, what do you need to do so your teeth won't feel scuzzy before you go to bed? I mean, just these kind of things like, instead of don't forget your coat, it's like, what do you need to take so you won't be cold outside? And it's just much more inviting to kids. We always role play with, ask the process with the kids who role play the kids and ask them what are they thinking and feeling and deciding and which creates more rebellion and which creates more thinking and responsibility and cooperation. So Jane, do you think that part of the story here is that these technologies are new and they often make adults nervous because we don't know what the ramifications are so we take shortcuts in dealing with children? Well, yes, but I think it's age old, and it just seems to be that, like, just when I was a new mother and I didn't know what to do, I would be either too kind or too firm. And it's just, you don't ever have to teach anybody how to be punitive. We all know how to be punitive. We all know how to lecture. But learning skills that invite children to want to talk because they feel listened to and taken seriously and getting them involved in helping to create solutions is just, it's a skill that has to be learned and practiced. Um, like Matt is saying, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work to say do as I say and not as I do. I mean, when we make demands of kids that uh, we model something different, they just get sneaky. So I just think it's so, if we want kids to be respectful, we have to be respectful to them. Like Matt is saying, model, model, model. And that, that's why I really lock, like the tool card on Backtalk. I'm not sure you have that one, but one of, one of the things that I just love is saying is don't backtalk back. Yeah, we tell kids, don't backtalk back. We, we tell kids not to backtalk, and then we backtalk to them. And then we wonder why they get rebellious and just go underground. So Jane, I want to ask some questions specifically related to new technology and, and how you might think uh, approaches that you might have related to them. Uh, one of which is, I think a lot of parents are nervous that their children are living their lives very publicly and that they are putting out a lot of information about themselves on the web. So I think I know how you'd answer this, but how would you answer this if a parent asked you that at a workshop? You know, again, I would say to sit down and talk with their children. It's like to, to sit down and ask kids questions about what they think will happen if this gets out and other people see it. What do they think? And see, I think that instead of imposing consequences on children, we need to help them explore the consequences. So they can think about what the long-term results might be. Um, what the consequences might be of them doing this, what might happen if other people see it. Like, I don't know if you saw that uh, video. It was um, on a talk show. Not, I don't know if it was a talk show. One of those news magazines where this kid that said something that was uh, sexual on a text message and, uh, or on Facebook or something, and he got, uh, maybe he was 18 anyway, he is now considered a sex offender and is uh, 
listed on all of the sex offender e websites. And that's going to carry him now <laughs> throughout his life. And so I think that they need to understand and explore some of the possibilities of what can happen if they're too public. Well, this is, this is such a difficult arena. I know that in a lot of ways, the story kind of for me last year that I kept hearing was, we're finally getting the police and FBI data. And in fact, a lot of what we thought were the dangerous activities turned out not to be the dangerous activities. So I think in part there's a lot of pressure from to our to, to our public officials to do something, but but people aren't quite sure what to do. So if you were giving that advice, what would you say? About what? Well, let's just say that the the you know the the issue is uh, sending sexual text messages, and and parents are are putting a lot of pressure to create laws or rules that relate to this. So you, how would you respond to that? I, I think that one of the problems I have with a lot of laws and rules is that people who have inner responsibility and respect for themselves and others don't need the rules. They would just be respectful. And when we have a lot of rules for the people who haven't learned these inner responsibilities and skills, they just go underground and break the rules anyway. So. I think that instead of having too many laws and rules, this is the time for parents to sit down and talk with their children, not to or at them, and discuss how to be respectful and what the consequences are. Um, again, I want to emphasize not imposing consequences on them, but helping them explore the consequences. I want to give you an example of what happened with one of my grandchildren recently. Through texting, and, and we all know that you can't, Sometimes emails and texts don't say what we mean because they don't have the right inflection and they can be misinterpreted. And so she was texting with a friend at high school. I don't know whether it was during class or not. But uh, the friend misinterpreted what she said, got angry, texted her back. And she lost one of her best friends that way. And there was a whole bunch of it. Then there was these sides taken up with these different people. And so it started kind of this fight. And in exploring with her the advantage of sometimes when you can text, you can't give the inflections you mean, and also you might react out of anger instead of waiting until you have calmed down. So I think that whenever these things happen, using them as an opportunity to talk to, with children about what happened, what caused it to happen, what could you learn from this, what ideas do you have to solve the problem, is very important. So you make the connection, Jane, uh, between the kind of things that we're talking about in the family, the family meetings, and working together to uh, understand and help grow responsibility. Um, do you want to make the connection to what kinds of things can take place in schools in that regard? Well, this is um, why we really advocate family uh, class meetings in schools because, again, the the schools that have regular class meetings. And where the kids, whenever there's a problem, they put it on the agenda. <laughs> Whoops, I'm getting a tickle. How do I go get a glass of water? Talk about, i got to go get some water. I'll be back in a minute. Talk. Okay, so Matt, I'm really appreciative of Matt and Steve and Barbara loving the comments here. And I'm curious, uh, because schools often tend to be a command and control structure, um, you know, are there specific lessons here related to technology that we should be kind of thinking about trying to promote within school cultures? And, and I don't know if the Castellea group wants to talk at all about what you do at Castellea, but that would be interesting to me. Oh, so is Steve going to respond to that? Yeah, and you can just respond in the chat. And um, well, one thing is they don't. Okay, so Matt, so this is really interesting. They don't filter. Um, and this is a, a, a very good, Matt, I'm right in saying this is a, a really good private school in Palo Alto. Uh, so rather than having the strict control of filtering, I'm guessing you have kind of an agreement with the students as to appropriate responsible use? But, well, also, you, you were cutting out, Steve, so I didn't hear the whole thing you said. but. I, Barbara is saying that she saw her daughter have a texting fight with a good friend because it's easier to say main, main things not face to face. That's a very good point. Yeah, so Matt's talking about using um, 
by, by the school not having a filtering system on the internet, then they engage the students in a discussion about responsible use. Right. Um, you know, in some cases, I think it's um, important for parents and teachers or sometimes when they just they need to set limits. But I think that the more often that you get the kids involved in helping to set the limits with a discussion about why the limits are necessary and that they can really agree to them. But, you know, uh, as much as I talk about trying to be respectful to kids and getting them involved, there are times when you just, there's even a tool card that says decide what you'll do. And instead of what you're going to make the child do, like for instance, uh, I'm not willing to pay a, for a cell phone if it's uh, getting in the way of our family communication. So we need to either, that would go on with choices, we need to either figure out a way that we can use it and not abuse it and still have our family time and communication or we just don't have cell phones for a while. Jane, is there a busyness issue here as well? I mean, you've had a, a, a length of time to, to watch things take place. Uh, does it feel like these technologies have enabled much uh, more opportunity to do different things and that people are busier, or is that just a, uh, a perception that every generation has? I, I really do think that it uh, creates more busyness. For example, there's, uh, I think there's even um, groups all now for screen time addiction, for uh, computer addiction. I also think that you're hearing more and more articles about how often people can get hooked into emails and just answering emails. And I know that this is a problem with me, for me because I get so many emails. I can spend six hours a day sometimes just answering emails. And of course, sometimes it saves time, but on the other hand, it really takes a lot of time. So you need to be very careful about learning about Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that, which is one of the reasons that I've uh, avoided it. I mean, I know I'm going to uh, learn how to use it, hopefully, but it's like Twitter and Facebook. I mean, good things are all very time consuming and they're lovely. I love being able to go and see what my grandkids are doing. I think all of this technology, technology has some really good benefits and it's just so easy to get into over to the extremes and to the abuse of it. And so uh, that would that uh, that relates specifically both to the youth but also to the adults because part of what I was thinking about was that as adults become busy in that way uh, they may not be taking the time to coach and train and have family meetings or class meetings because they just feel a little overwhelmed themselves. Exactly. Do, do you by any chance have the pay attention tool card? Uh, in the pay attention tool card, it shows the father busy reading the newspaper and when the child is trying to communicate. But I think that in these days, we could almost have a father sitting at a computer or a mother and getting so hooked at the computer that they're not paying uh, attention. So this is fascinating because it does feel a, a little bit like we're in an economic period of time and a technological period of time where the pressures are very high. It's very hard to take the time, and, but that's what's really needed. Exactly, and uh, even on vacations these days, I mean, in, in some ways I can see the advantage of having the videos that the kids are watching all the time that they're driving, and yet I think that they should also talk about, okay, we'll watch these for, if you're going on a long vacation, we'll watch these maybe for an hour or whatever it takes, and then we'll play some family discussion games or something. It's just, I think that the whole thing is moderation discussion so that it doesn't uh, interfere with the good family connection communication time. So we took a vacation in August uh, as a family together and uh, at the end we uh, realized that we had only actually watched one movie together and the rest of the time we had done activities and to us that was sort of a sign of success. We thought, you know, we actually did it, we did it right. We didn't, we didn't spend our time engaged in uh, activities that, that didn't bring us together. We actually did things together. And did you all decide that as a family? 
No, but but I think uh, it was nice. We we decided we we met and decided all the activities together, and I, and I'm guessing that was engaging enough that it meant we didn't have to default to some some entertainment activities that don't actually bring the kind of closeness that we were looking for. Well, exactly. I think that the fact that they all got together and whoops, and to get rid of that thing, <laughs> uh, I I think that that had a lot to do with it. That the, the kids were involved in part of it. Matt saying air conditioning may be more damaging to a sense of community and conversation than the internet. Quite honestly, so Matt, I'm wondering if you're talking about what I notice, which is. We'll walk our neighborhood streets and nobody will be outside. Oh, I wondered what he, I wondered what he meant by that. In fact, I, uh, I'm, a big, uh, I'm a big lover of Craigslist and I, and I bought a, an exercise bike some months back and had to go to a relatively poor part of town where we live. And what was so noticeable to me was that there were all kinds of families sitting out side together talking in the evening, which never happens in my neighborhood. Well, but I also need to, want to mention that where I grew up, because we didn't grow up before TV, all of the kids in the neighborhood were out playing games. We were playing hide and seek and run, she be run and kick the can. And uh, of course, we didn't, nobody had fences. I mean, it was a different time. And I feel nostalgic about that. Yeah, there, there's some other fascinating things going on. There have been articles in the last couple of weeks, Jane, in some pretty prominent uh, newspapers and magazines about how parents don't allow their children to go anywhere alone. Have you read any of those? Oh, I think that's going on a lot because of the you know, kidnapping and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of that where kids are, parents are afraid to let their kids play out in the neighborhood these days. Oh, I have to comment to Steve Pappy who says, oh, I just lost it. He's gotten too young to have the stuff. No, I'm not. <laughs> I was raised before television. In fact, I can't remember, though. I was in high school when television came out, and my dad used to spend hours, I bet a lot of you don't even remember that, trying to adjust the circle on the screen so that it was to get the best view or whatever it was. <laughs> Well, and so some of this also relates to technology because I think, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the the statistics on child abductions haven't increased at all, but it's the visibility that we now have if a child in another state is missing, we hear about it. And so there, you know, from a very objective standpoint, it doesn't seem as though kids are in any more risk, but we're much more aware of it. And there's an enormous amount of social pressure that these articles bring out where parents who allow their children to bike to school actually face um, social pressure from others who tell them it's just the wrong thing to do. That is so interesting. I really think that is interesting. I mean, I had not heard that, that the statistic, because that is another thing. It's like with, with the media, it's like it's real easy to catastrophize and to make things even bigger than they are because something happens and it's just talked and talked about and made to be huge. So it's real easy to get the idea that it could be worse today even when it's not. That's very interesting. Well, I think um, there's a lot of uh, passion behind this. And I know that uh, you know I e emailed some of these articles to my own father and said, hey, you know, isn't this interesting, uh, one child was walking to school a block and a half or two blocks or something, and, the, and a police officer actually picked the child up, brought the child home, and and chastised the parent for letting the child be alone. And you know, I sent it to my dad, thinking he would say, "Yeah, isn't that kind of sad?" And he said, "Well, I wouldn't let my kids walk very far." And I thought, "Boy, we we don't have a good common sense. We don't have a sense together as a society right now about whether or not it's safe for a child to be alone." Right. <laughs> and I, I think that sometimes we forget uh, how different it was or what we do that when we, when we hear other people. But it's like you do hear these tragedies about, for example, uh, kids being left in the car and they die. 
And so the other day, my daughter was here visiting, just wanted to park the car outside, left the air conditioning on, and wanted to come in for a few minutes. We said, oh, you might get arrested if you leave him out there even for a minute, even though it was just right in the driveway. <laughs> so we do, we do get that uh, fear created. And I think Lorna points out the media has a role to play, but there are tragic events, and we don't want that event to be with our child. Exactly. Okay, Jane, so we only have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that if anybody wants to ask a question, then they can raise their hand and grab the mic or continue to put them in the chat. Did you want to show any others of these cards that you think might relate specifically to um, to the use of technologies, to the to the new challenges because of this, uh, uh, I'm thinking of natural consequences. Yeah, natural consequences or family meetings. But I I also think that maybe if it's only related to uh, a question that might come up, I I would love to hear somebody take the microphone because to see what that sounds like. Steve or Matt, would either of you like to grab the mic? We could hear you before, Matt. Matt, we can see that your mic is on, but we're not hearing anything from you. Is your volume slider turned up? Can you hear me now okay? Or? Yeah, oh, you yeah, do great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. I, when I, I think one of my audio settings was, was goofed up. Yeah, so Jane, um, that, I don't think we're that far off, quite honestly. I, my, my only point regarding that uh, one of your bullet points in one of your one of the first slides, I think it was about the computer in the bedroom. I, I I mean I totally agree with that. I just think in some situations, you know, we do have we do see some students who are exceptionally mature and and um, have that discipline that that have internalized that discipline and and can handle that. Um, and 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 my point is too, is with a lot of these issues that we see with texting and you know, the media just love to, um, I don't know, maybe statistically youth do text when they drive and talk on their cell phones when they drive more than adults. Um, perhaps that is very true. I just oftentimes think that youth get a very uh, a bad rap and I think they, um, uh, again, they, um, they see adults doing that right, and so uh, they see their parents doing that, and that's where I think they they learn to do those kinds of things. And I think that goes just just the point that that we we discussed in the chat room about modeling, modeling, modeling. So um, I, I I just like to provide you know I'm an advocate for youth, and um, and, and think they do their resilience. I think I mentioned this. Their resilience to me is remarkable given that sometimes we're not um, the best uh, uh, models out there. Well, Matt, I uh, totally, totally agree to you, with you. And I don't think that it all is a matter of maturity. And this is why I think that you have to have discussions and you have to come up with agreements because I'm, I feel like I'm pretty mature. And I got addicted to playing hearts and bridge and canasta, I mean, literally. I mean, it was so funny because I would be playing uh, these games late at night with my head dropping, knowing, I, why can't I stop? Why don't I stop? And I didn't stop until I took the darn things off the computer and went into cold turkey. <laughs> so this is what I'm just saying because I've even experienced myself how addictive this can be. And so I don't think that it's, I would want my kids to have not have any supervision at all or to have any discussion or to have any guidelines and just, because it, it, it can be very abusive. So Matt, I really appreciate that point and I think uh, um, there's some general agreement about that. Um, and, I, and I know I've had to change my driving habits because it may not be texting, but um, I can be distracted and I uh, have recognized the casualness in my own behavior that uh, I didn't want my kids to uh, inherit. Well, one thing we know for sure is modeling is extremely important. That uh, we've all probably seen that children live, learn what they live, and so modeling is very important. So, Jane, I've put up your positive discipline Ning site, which is a, a joy to see you doing that. And uh, while it's up, uh, there was a question from L.S. 
who says, did we talk about uh, computer addiction? And I think you just mentioned it, but w uh, what would you recommend in that circumstance if uh, you felt like a, a child was um, heavily involved? Well, it's just because I, I know that it's uh, true. I know that it's that TV and any screen time can be addictive, and this is why I think we have to be very careful. And, then, and this is another reason why I think that, uh, to, did you put up that link to that iBrain discussion that went on? I did. It's in the chat, and it will be in the chat log, but I'll find it and post it again. Okay. Well, the other thing about this uh, Ning, and uh, Steve, this is something that you turned me on to, and uh, so we have this positive discipline social network where people can join and uh, then join different groups. We have a lot of different groups for like positive discipline the first three years and positive discipline for teenagers and positive discipline for school age. And you know, there's a bunch of groups, positive, positive discipline for Montessorians, for single parents. Um, so it, and people are being very supportive of each other on these groups and they give great suggestions and great advice and people don't feel so alone when they're having problems with potty training and temper tantrums and kids that won't talk and whatever. So we've got about four minutes left. Uh, if you have a question for Jane, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Jane, um, I think you need to do a regular show on, on parenting and Illuminate. I'm sorry, I was reading the question. What did you, I mean, it was comment. What did you just say? It's <laughs> hard to, need, to multitask here. <laughs> I know. I think you need to do a regular show. I would love oh. the idea of you doing a monthly live Illuminate show. Well, that's something that we'll have to look into. I can, I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying to talk you into it. Okay. okay <laughs> other questions? Any final questions for Jane before we wrap up? I got to tell you, Jane, it's been really fun to listen to you again. Uh, you reminded me just uh, how important the principles are, and even though the challenges may be different, that it's uh, going back to some core principles that are a part of the the work that you've done and, and, that, and that come so well out of um, Adler and Dreikers. So we've got good links in the chat, and we'll post the chat log later for people to look at those again. And uh, we will have a recording of the show, and uh, certainly encourage you to. Uh, to to listen to it if you weren't able to hear all of it and let others know about it. Jane, any final thoughts? Well, Steve, I just uh, really appreciate what you just said is that I think that uh, most of the basic principles that we talk about in positive discipline and that Rudolf Dreiker and Alfred Adler talked about can be uh, uh, applicable to all of these modern day problems because it's just getting back to basic respect where you talk with kids, you problem solve together, you find solutions, you focus on solutions. Uh, a big theme of positive discipline now is connection before correction. It's like, so that importance of really helping your kids know, yes, I really love you and the answer is no, or I care about you, let's sit down and talk about uh, some, some solutions. So thanks for reminding me of all that too. Okay, it looks like uh Lorna and Matt want to ask you to invite you to be on another show. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thanks to Teresa Beffa, who's our co-host slash intern. Thanks, Teresa, for being here. I didn't recognize you early on. I should have, but appreciate your input and participation. Thanks to Jane. I'm going to do the clapping for Jane, the little clapping hand at the bottom of the participant window. Jane, I'm just so fun <laughs> to hear your voice again and hear you talking. Uh, we'll look forward to to connecting again. So the show officially ends now, uh, but I'm going to let Lorna and Matt take the mic if they'd like and talk to you about their idea. Okay. Hey Jane, this is it, it's Matt again, and, and I think Lorna is probably grabbing the mic right now, but um, I think what she's going to ask you is if you would be willing to join us on, we participate, or we, we have a uh, regular webcast over at edtechtalk.com, and um, we have it's uh, the uh, it broadcasts live on the first and third Mondays of each month. And uh, the title or the name of the webcast series is Parents as Partners. So we would love um, to per to perhaps have you on to um, 
have a have a similar uh, type of discussion perhaps in the future. Well, Matt, could you email me and give me the information? It's just Jane at positivediscipline.com. Here, I can write that. Um, I think I've learned to do so. Jane at p o s i i d. The only trouble is is making sure that you spell discipline correctly. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. Yeah, I'm on that, Matt. Oh, great, Lorna. Yeah, it sounds exciting. We would really be very, very pleased, Jane, if you could join us in our discussions where we really focus our attention on um, trying to be, build positive relationships with uh, the educators and parents. So everything that you're bringing to, this, to the discussion today will be a, a wonderful addition to uh, what we are trying to do. Oh, great. I, I, I'll look forward to hearing more about it from, on the email. Okay, great. This is Thanks, the first Jane. Time. Jane, this is the first time I've done an interview like this where now three people are asking the guests to come on their shows. So it's, uh -huh. high, pra it's high praise. <laughs> oh, okay. So parenting 2.0. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everybody. Okay, Thank Jane, you. we're going to let you go. Thanks for a great show. Nice to hear your voice again. Feel free to just close the uh, Illuminate down or go to File Exit. We'll okay. let you go. The rest of you can stick on and uh, leave messages for each other for a couple of minutes, and then we'll close it out so the recording will process.